Over the last 12 months, we've been filming a Grousemoor estate in the Angus Glens. We were asked to record how this landscape can work for the landowners, the people they employ, and the wildlife in the 21st century. For the locals, it means employment. Recreation. Community. It's a place where scientists come to explore its biodiversity, its spectacles. And for the lucky few, who pay handsomely for the privilege, they become a crucial part of the year in the life of a grouse moor. It's the end of February. After a wet winter, there's a window of opportunity for heather burning. It looks destructive, but like a lot of things in a grouse moor, looks can be deceptive. It's all part of our habitat management. When the first heather comes through, it's where they come to feed. The next stage of heather, when this gets going, it will be uh, somewhere for them to maybe nest. And then when it's getting a lot older, maybe eight, nine years old, and that's for winter feeding when there's, when there's snow on the ground and also when the predators are chasing, they've got somewhere to hide and take cover. We're lighting it with a, what we call a heather wand. The butane bottle screws into it little ignition and it's away. Today because it's not going very fast and it's well broken up we're lighting it and then we're able to just cut the sides each side and it just runs into another fire. Actually some of these fires run into wreaths of snow. If the heather is left for too long without burning it it just grows and grows and grows and it ends up sort of growing to a length and then breaking over. It gets to the stage where there's no nutritional value in it. The sheep don't get any benefit from it, or no, none of the species, none of the hares or the deer. If you didn't burn it, it the whole the whole area would be one long, huge bed of heather, and you know, if God forbid, if picnic, I came along with a barbecue or whatever, had a fire, it got away, you know, you could lose the whole area in one go, so because we have it sort of broke up in a little patchwork, it stops the danger of like a wildfire taking out the whole area. It's April in Scotland, and we are experiencing four seasons in one day. On the low ground, there's a courtship display that wouldn't look out of place on the floor of the Amazon jungle. About 40 male black grouse fight and posture. They're lecking, trying to attract the attention of the hens. It's no coincidence that a group of academics and students have travelled from Germany to study the black game and also map the species diversity across this glen. I said at the moment I study about black grouse in, in Germany and in the Alps you have some places where you find them still but uh, in quite low numbers. You have a lack with four or five male black grouse and here our first day we found here 24, there are 20 and 16 on the other place. Uh, the, the really, I, I don't know the word for that, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's great to see so many. You, you won't find many places like this where you can show students such a, a number of, of different animals and uh, how many birds that you almost cannot find in other areas. Dr. Daniel Hoffman is the executive director of Game Conservancy Germany. He's publishing a paper on his findings. 
Dr Hoffman understands the international importance of this part of Scotland, its fragility and the species that depend on it for a nesting ground. When you will reduce the intensity of gamekeeping here, you will lose species. You still find heathers and the grasslands, but uh, the animals uh, will go two or three years maximum and then you will have many foxes here, you will have many stoats and weasels and so on. Then they reduce biodiversity and you have only some species in, in high numbers and other species in low numbers or, or even you lose them totally. Lapwings, golden plover and oyster catchers are all crown nesting birds and are vulnerable to predation. Just a few metres from the black grouse lake is a single egg in what can barely be described as a nest. It doesn't even need an opportunist crow or stoat to find it and destroy it. It could be us wandering from the designated footpath, a dog off the lead, or even a deer could damage this egg with one unfortunate footstep. And yet the birds are here in good numbers. What happens if you don't manage them or you end up with several possible alternative land uses? One is going to be forestry, obviously. Uh, commercial forestry has nothing like the benefits that we would see here in terms of the environment, in terms of the landscape, in terms of the scenery. One is a much more intensive form of sheep farming. You're going to end up with a much more sterile grass hill as a, as a result. One is that you simply do nothing. You leave it in its, its, if you like, what's perceived as its wild state. But it doesn't support anything like the same volume of, of wildlife. It can't support the same numbers of, of curlew or of, of black game or of any of the species that sit alongside the red, the red grouse. So all of these alternatives are far less valuable to us as a nation. They're far less appealing visually and they're just nothing like as good as a, as a well-managed grouse moor. Out in the moor, it's not just the birds coping with the chill winds. The blue hair is also plentiful. These characterful mammals don't seem to realise that as the snow has receded, their white camouflage coat is not quite so helpful. People who don't understand hair culls accuse the states of persecuting the animals. Not here. And there is a perception amongst uh, some people that they are, there's very few of them and their populations might be in danger. But in fact, uh, on these managed moorlands, it, it, it's, the situation is the opposite. Uh, the keepers up here are seeing, especially in recent years, have seen a big increase in the, the number of white hares. And this is a, a classic example of a, a debate that is being held on the basis of not enough knowledge and not enough appreciation of what actually goes on on the ground. We return in June, and there's new life on the moor. The winter and spring have been wet and cold, and the keepers are worried that even with all their efforts, the weather is going to have the last word. There's plenty of work to do before the start of the season, which is just weeks away. Buildings have to be renovated to house staff, others converted to holiday lets. Some will be a base for the shooting guests during the season. They all need maintaining and managing. With investment comes the need for local labour. 
Builders, plumbers, electricians are all finding work here. The benefits that are gained uh, from the shooting in, in an upland area like this uh, is very important because it's the biggest employer now in an upland area. Sheep farming's in decline, also forestry doesn't really offer any local work, so it's really the, the, the shooting side of, the, of an upland area uh, provides benefits for, for the local community, you know, shops, local school, tradesmen, hotels, restaurants, uh, there's a great deal of benefit uh, accrued by many people. I mean, all, all the, the families that are employed and live on the estates now, uh, they're generally younger people with young families up and coming, and it's those families that will keep the, the rural schools uh, going. It's late August. This is the moment the estate has been preparing for. All the work behind the scenes is now centre stage. Whether it's the kitchens, the gun room or on the moor, things have to be just right. One of the invited guests is George Digweed MBE, the multi-world champion clay shot and one of the best game shots in the world. He is offering some tuition prior to the big day. A grouse trap above them simulates the unique way a driven grouse will fly tomorrow. Where were you on that one? Beautiful, and again, not only can the guns that come up enjoy some practice before they go out, but also the keepers can come on here and absolutely fine tune their technique to be able to go out, whether they're shooting vermin, rabbits, magpies, whatever they're shooting on the estate, they're in a perfect place to be able to place that shot perfectly and make a good clean kill. The only thing you hit with that shot was me. The big day itself requires military precision. A thick mist means there is a good chance no shots will be fired today. But as it lifts, the anticipation builds. Danny is the head keeper. The day's shooting is his responsibility. I'm Danny, the head keeper. We're here to shoot grouse today, red grouse. There is a chance we'll see some black game this morning, so if you could leave them, please, today. There's a lot of pressure on him and the army of local help. Soon they will be marching across, up and over the estate, working the wind and the ground to drive the wild red grouse towards the guns. Uh, yeah, this is probably the most nervous time actually. When you go into the first drive, you never know what's happened before you get there. Especially it's 12 o'clock now because of late start with the fog. We're going to try and squeeze three drives in and because you start this late, you're just constantly chasing your tail. What slows down a day is the beaters moving and obviously you can only move around so quickly, sort of 35, 40 guys. So. But the whole grouse was that kind of, I've never seen it before. George is not only a world champion, no. but a countryman who understands the work that goes into making a day like this run smoothly. It's something you can't do regularly, we're privileged to be able to do it, but you've seen the amount of people that are involved and how it brings a community together and I think that uh, to be part of that, whether you're a gun, whether you're a flanker, whether you're a beater, whether you're picking up, is, uh, is a fantastic thing for the sport that the whole of that community is brought together under the, under the common goal of shooting and conservation. And, uh, you know, you can't do this regularly. We certainly haven't got any heather in Sussex, so for us to be able to come up here and shoot, you know, driven grouse, albeit, you know, how big a day you ever shoot, just to be on the moor is a privilege. On the next drive, we join Johnny Goodhart, 
another seasoned game shot and managing director of CCI Clays. The only thing you can see man-made are roads, one wagon at the top dropping off the beaters, and what else? Nothing. Glorious. Very privileged and very spoilt to go more. It's just one of the great, great sports of this country. Whistle's gone, that's it, end of. Look, look, look at this line of beaters here. I mean, how can you fail not to appreciate it? Thank you very much, well done. Brilliant, that's very kind. Thank you very much, Steve. Cheers, thank you. Well done. Oh, shit. That's good work. I've hit that. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll have it. That's fine, I'll, I'll grab it. It's actually, it's not the work done today that's the, 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 the key to it. It's the work done for the other 364 days a year, if you're going to shoot one there. I mean, this year is not a good year for grouse. Um, but the work still goes on, whether they have a bumper season or whether they have a, a very average season. And, you know, this year, pretty much throughout the UK, we've got a very average season, but the work still goes on, and you, that's the stuff you don't see. And I, you know, I take my hat off to these keepers. You know, they work up here, they live up here um, all year round, um, protecting the various species of birds and, and, and uh, flora fauna we've got up here. You know, they, do a, they really do a fantastic job. The National Game Bag Census is the oldest bird count in the country, recording wild bird populations across the UK going back 200 years. It's all part of the management plan. The grouse season has ended, but the estate is still shooting. The focus has shifted from the very tops of the moor to the lowlands and the pheasants and partridge. Go up, up okay. into the wood, okay. then we'll yeah. kind of push up so far up. We'll oh, I mean, all, all low ground shoot is down. as important like as the, uh, the grouse to uh, the owner and the community, really. Um, when the grouse season finishes middle of uh, December, but generally we pack up mid-October late to late October and then that's when we get into our pheasants and partridges. Our grouse season this year wasn't great it was it was you know we had we had 17 days so it was fine we, we made the most of what we had it, it wasn't as good as the previous year due to bad weather during uh, nesting and hatching time. We can only do so much but we can't stop mother nature. Unlike the grouse these are not wild birds but they soon will be if they're not managed by the gamekeepers. Once again, the shoot days are labour intensive. The beaters gather early at the bothy before being taken by lorry to the first drive. The grounds here are well known for delivering challenging birds. Uh, good pheasant shoot is making it challenging for everybody, the gun shooting, and just making sure everyone has a good time, really. At this time of year, the number of visitors to rural Scotland dwindles. Not here. The shooting parties fill hotel rooms and bring money into the area during the general tourism off-season. Nothing else would have such a positive economic impact. You know, they were, they were saying last night they were in and around Kirrymuir and there was, there was nobody uh, out at all other than those guys and there was uh, nine of them going out uh, having a drink or two, I'm sure. Uh, this time of year, the glens aren't just as pretty as they are during the summer and the weather's not as good. Um, so a lot of the, uh, the income for the, the, the 
hotels and restaurants and pubs around here will be from shooting parties from uh, in the area and out of the area using the hotels. On the low ground it's cold but there's no snow. A short drive up onto the moor and it offers a far more wintry scene. The impressive blue hair numbers mean that a group of falconers have been given permission to hunt in the estate. Golden eagles, native to this part of Britain, and hardwired to hunt hares. It's an impressive sight. Roy Lupton has hunted with his birds all over Scotland and has seen many estates lose their hares through climate change and mismanagement. Not here. Certainly on this estate they seem to be uh, allowing a good population, a respectable population to thrive. So it's superb for us. Although we're not killing a lot of them, you know, it's fantastic. It, you know, we're getting some great sport. We're using all the hares that we catch as well, so they're all getting eaten in the lodge of an evening. It's amazing how many different recipes you can come up for hair. So, uh, yeah, hair for heaters, hair curries, hair everything. But, yeah, it's, I mean, it's incredibly good meat, actually. The days may be short, but the hours are still being worked. The farm is another of the vital parts of this Scottish estate sustaining and future-proofing the life here. We end our year in the life of a grouse moor with another spectacular drive. The guns are getting some world-class shooting and they're very happy. There's already talk of booking again next year. And so helping guarantee the livelihoods of the people who call this estate home. At the centre of it all, it's beating heart. A grouse moor.